<clears throat> In Sato Haruro's 1924 essay, A Discourse on Elegance, he states that if a poem is to speak to us with true originality, it has to convey an inimitable sense of the sad impermanence of experience. Certainly, along with so many other astonishing qualities, a sense of the sad impermanence of experience dignifies Peg Boyer's writing, though she registers that sad impermanence with pointless detail. <clears throat> Just as one example, allow me to read a stanza from her poem, Machine of Regret, of having, then losing, and having and wishing to have had. A stanza I have taped on the inside cover of my travel notebook, a kind of talisman, I suppose. Simply put, in both of Peg Boyer's published collections, along with the decisive accomplishment of each individual poem, there are thematically unifying elements. In her first book, Hard Bread, there is what one critic called, quote, inspired ventriloquism. In that Miss Boyer's literary preoccupations are sponsored by the life and writings of Italian novelist Natalia Ginsburg. The sustaining paradox here, though, is that this duet of Ginsburg's and Boyer's sensibilities allows for what in the West we might call autobiography, but again, in Haruro's essay, he calls painful subjectivity. Peg Boyer's second book, Honey with Tobacco, extends and intensifies this painful subjectivity as her poems take us into her Cuban-American experience, the peripatetic displacements of childhood, unique and surprising disquisitions on art, and so forth. Henri Cole writes, this book takes us back like taste and smell to the place where memory, pungent and sweet and acrid, tries to provide the key to everything. You'll readily have discovered by now I'm not in the least adept at the vocabulary of criticism, perhaps especially about poetry of the first order, as Miss Boyer's poetry is, and therefore is so daunting to speak about anyway. In the reading of poetry, I'm perhaps too susceptible even devoted to Retke's suggestion that we think a thing halfway through and feel it the rest of the way. However, I must say that with Peg Boyer's writing, Retke's emotional equation works quite well for me. That said, I've read some of Peg's most recent poems. Here the setting, what Calvino calls the passionate place, is Venice. Now clearly, Peg Boyers knows Venice very well. But one of the decisive generosities of these new poems is how we witness her deepening her knowledge of this city, at the same time uh, coming to knowledge of herself, often in retrospect, while in the city of Venice itself. I think Peg will probably be reading some of um, those poems tonight, or several. But I need to linger just a brief moment on one poem in particular. Uh, it's called To Forget Venice because it is such a stunning elegy. The title itself is a lovely contradiction, well past irony, because once you read this poem, Venice is even more indelible, that is, unforgettable. The poem is dedicated to the painter Michael Mazur. I got married in Michael and his wife's Gale backyard in Cambridge. That personal note aside, if there was ever a complicated fellow, it was Mike, full of emotionally and aesthetically opposing forces, a huge spirit, a dynamo of opinion, loquacious, at times almost intoxicated by his own erudition, who celebrated the importance and beauty of art with uncompromised insistence. Protean, and he painted all night like Picasso. In the poem, To Forget Venice, Peg Boyers writes in direct address, but in truth, before you, I am usually mute, 
riding out your blue streak. And it's true, Mike not only talked a blue streak, but seemed to be riding through life with a certain spiritual velocity. <clears throat> In the poem, Peg Boyers and Michael Mazur, poet and painter, seem to be on an interwoven journey of souls. Peg being a brilliant student of people, Mazur's very personality comes so alive that it is impossible not to conflate the joys and vicissitudes of friendship with this difficult, beautiful man, with the very same attributes of the ancient city they are walking in, its water-bordered streets. That is, the painter's very nature becomes the city. This poem has the inner music of walking. It has a breathtaking sense of nostalgia for the present. It has poignant visual searching. It has the spectral immediacy of a seance and the permanent melancholy of an epitaph one might discover on a gravestone in San Michel Cemetery in Venice. Thank you, Howard. That was so <laughs> moving. It's hard to, hard to try to gather myself. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for t continuing to come out here. Uh, it's been a great season. It's wonderful to see some of my Skidmore friends here, too. I don't know if you can hear me back there. Is <laughs> uh, hi. Um, I'm going to read two newish long poems tonight, both of which are walks through Venice. Uh, one at the beginning and one at the end, so we can sort of recover in between. I don't mean because they need recovering, but they're just long. Um, and then I'll also read uh, just a few short poems in between, just little short lyrics uh, from other books. Um, the first poem I'll read, uh, which Howard has told you something about, is an elegy for the painter and printmaker Michael Major, um, who, like me, had um, some very important years of his childhood in Venice, and who was forever marked by that. Um, the Biennale I refer to in the poem is the International Art Fair held there every two years um, at Venice's only park known as the Giardini, the gardens. So that'll come up. I just didn't want you to not know what that was. To Forget Venice for Michael Major. I never think of you in August. So now, though you love Venice and we're just in on the early train, already busy fighting the day-tripping August mob, I'm not thinking of you. In Cambridge, it's still night and probably cool. And here in Venice, we're so hot, we forget to look at the new Calatrava bridge spanning the canal or at the canal itself, shimmering its greasy reflections. We barely notice the churches with their bronze plaques promising quattrocento treasures behind rough brown facades. We pass them by, too hot, too bored, too jaded from weeks assaulted and undone by Florence's glut of fancy green and white marble confections. The churches, we say, the churches of Venice have never seemed as weirdly plain, as homely, downright ugly as they do today in the positively tropical heat, in the positively godforsaken barren stretch of stone and backwater clothesline infested pigeon shit covered campo after dead end campo. What's that about? Maybe you'd have said, because the city, most of it, is so goddamn gorgeous, it was a form of prayer for the odd builder to renounce ornament for the walls of God's house. Or maybe you'd have just let me go on that way and thought to yourself, what bullshit. We drag up in front of Santa Maria dei Miracoli, that tiny anonymous jewel of a perfect marble temple in Canareggio, with not one painting of interest inside to distract from its external white and pink resplendence. Its second gilded cupola topping a slender off-kilter bell tower listing flirtatiously toward the canal. We always come to it in its otherwise drab quarters as upon a Lilliputian mirage crossing one of those ponti storti that fork out in two directions 
onto a church-lit island, astonished. You know the one I mean. I never asked, and you never said. Nor did I ever ask you how you cool down when you walk on days like this clear across town to the Giardini, as we do now, sucking ices through the back streets, avoiding the riva ablaze in the heat, avoiding the open patch of white stone burning before that run-down palazzo where you lived for a year when you were a kid with an Italian host family. Remembering the story about that time, about their daughter, we turn from the shady back street and head straight for the red brick facade of what's now a hotel and stare, retrieving what we can of the tale. Some expectation, a disappointment maybe, not a scandal, but enough for you to tell it with some mix of rue and amusement. Nothing to diminish your sense of the city as some kind of home to which you return again and again. Or is this my compulsion, not yours, to be here for every biennale, no matter the heat, no matter the awfulness of what we come back each time to see, the Giardini pavilions basting in the sun, a park, hardly a park, consecrated to someone's idea of art, the selected dreck of nations. Now I am thinking of you, wishing you were here to give us permission to laugh at the miles of stale installations, acres of exhausted Duchampian crap, recherche ironies and politically correct profundities. I imagine you present, lounging just out of sight on a freshly painted bench, hesitant, checking your dismay, urging us to check ours, Would such sense of guild honor have allowed you to take it all in without scorn? Your elfin smile answers and shames me. In my dreams, I spout articulate rage and superior wit. But in truth, before you, I am usually mute, riding out your hilarious blue streak. No sacrifice to listen and laugh. By now, it's noon in Cambridge, sunset where we are. And I need to ask you today, what do you think? What would you have thought of the Spain Pavilion with the huge milky landscapes of Barceló, whose work, though he is Catalan and resides in Africa, reminds me of yours. His radiographic lithos are almost copies of your own eerie X-ray prints. Something about his large ceramic vessels reminds, brings to mind your own rocks and sculpture in water paintings, those stubborn totems of resilience, stalwart against the painted current. Hours later, nighttime in the Hotel Giorgione, I turn on my laptop and see the globe's online obit. Stylized blossoms in purple and pink fairly leap off the page. Oops, excuse me. Fairly leap off my monitor, and I think, not for the last time, that there is something I need to ask you about them. All those flowers everywhere in your drawings and paintings, flowers, rocks, water, the flowers so missed in this city of water and stone, neither of us has ever really left behind. Here, but not here, in this place where nothing is ever lost. So I'll read another different kind of walk through Venice, short poem called Moonwalk. It takes place July 20th, 1969, which is the date of the first moon landing. Oh, the Italian words are just the names of, um, are just my address in Venice, which is obvious from the context. Moonwalk, July 20th, 1969. It is midnight on Earth. The Venice station by now, half dreamscape, half memory, in the wake of my first breakup, is empty. Night mist rising from the canals. The usual bustle of vendors and tourists, gone. I am alone. Just in on the train from Paris, adrift, 
broke and fighting panic, I am midway through my 18th summer, at home, but not in the deserted city. Walking the circular streets across town to Castello, my old orbit, TV lights spinning, spilling out windows, my only guide, as I look for and find the old address. 39-12, 39-12, eccolo 39-12. Little has changed. The old neighbors are still the old neighbors, and I ring the bell next to their brass nameplate. I ascend the stairs to the rooftop apartment where, deferring to the television, we greet each other in silence. Our reunion after five years is unimportant. I am not the child they once knew, but they are the same, wordlessly watching the hazy specter of a man in a spacesuit bouncing, floating over the dunes, hypnotic shots of a lunar landscape. Walter Cronkite anchors the scene as the module eagle descends, then drifts into the sea of tranquility, its surface littered with boulders landing softly on something like sand. Magnificent desolation, giant step, the words crackle down to us with the solitary image of our weightless flag planted there, grainy and gray, against all odds, against gravity. The reel loops and we are up in the air, drifting again over and over in the module, surveying again the sci-fi future passing already into our dated past. Dante called it the first sphere of heaven, inhabited by souls who, deficient in fortitude, abandoned their vows. Released, reeling, aimless as the moon in the canal below, I am in flight, alone, undone. So I'll read a few short poems now from other books. Um, I'll read two poems about childhood. Uh, one from the child's perspective, the other from the parent's perspective. Um, both are in my book, Honey with Tobacco. First is called Playa Colorada. It means red beach. Um, Colorada is, uh, you know, it's not roja is a more familiar word, but Colorada just means like colored. Like when you have your face is Colorada, it's, it's like in, colored in shame. Playa Colorada. This was a real beach in Venezuela where I spent part of my childhood. It was a beach, like all beaches, only perhaps more beautiful. And the sand was pink, not red. We would arrive in caravans, hampers overflowing with food and drink, like Aziz and his party on the way to Malabar, the colonials and their servants away on an outing. We would stop under thatch umbrellas, towels and tablecloths spread out against the sea, my mother in her skirted swimsuit, surrounded by fathers of other children, her olive skin lit through her straw hat. They would laugh and drink beer and leer, while the children did the usual beach things, boring feudal tunnels to China, running at waves and then away, daring each other to be swallowed. I would go out by the forbidden rocks and pick off oysters, then give them to the men to pry open, cover with lime juice, and suck dry. Once I saw my mother sucking an oyster out of another daddy's hand. Her dappled face bobbed and smiled, and her tongue searched the shell for pearls. This one's from the same book. It's from a series um, of poems based on little religious tableaus, like as in Renaissance painting. But in fact, you don't need to know that. If I read it without context, it's really about my own child. Before losing you at the market, finding you in the temple. Summer nights at the souk, jugglers and hucksters, vendors, boiling at their stands, the three of us hand in hand but cranky from the heat. My grip on you would loosen and you'd break away, then come back, then be off again, appraising the tchotchkes, chatting up merchants. You were like that, affable, beyond reason, little god enrolled 
enrobed in light, diving into the crowd, riding it like a wave. And we, the pathetic shore awaiting you, diminished by every foray, consoled by the returns, until we were the thinnest sliver of beach imaginable. And you, you were the sea. I think I forgot to turn off my cell phone. <laughs> just, just so you know. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read two marriage poems. Uh, one is in the voice of the Italian writer uh, Natalia Ginsberg that Howard mentioned. Um, I've read it here, I think, but um, it picks up her history on the day when she goes to a um, prison in Rome to visit her husband. She's managed to get in there by um, putting on custodial clothing. But when she gets there, he's already dead. He's been tortured. He was in the resistance and tortured and killed. So this comes out of that experience as I imagine it. Memoria, Regina Celli Prison, Rome, 1944. On such a day, an ordinary day, men come and go in the city streets. They buy food and newspapers, they rush to their appointments, faces flushed, pink lips full. On such a day, you dressed in custodian uniform, entered the prison, went to his cell. You saw the hard bed where he had lain and the blank wall he watched day after day and the barred window beyond eye level through which his hope leaked month after month. You lifted the sheet to look at his face, leaned over to kiss him in the usual way, but it was the last kiss. It was the usual face, just a little more tired, and his clothes were the ones he always wore, and the shoes were the ones he always wore, and the hands were the ones that broke the bread and poured the wine. Today, still, during the hours that slowly pass, you lift the sheet again, and then again you look at his face for the last time and feel again the cold last kiss, the press of stiff, mute lips, and then again the sheet. If you walk down the street, no one walks next to you. If you're afraid, no one takes your hand. And the street is not yours, and the city is not yours. Not yours, the city of lights. The city of lights belongs to others, to the men who come and go and buy food and newspapers. You can look for a while out the quiet window, look in silence at the garden in the dark. Before, when you cried, there was his voice. When you laughed, his diffident smile but the gate that opened each evening will stay closed now forever, and your youth has become a deserted house. Fire out, shutters sealed. I'm going to read a, another little poem about a couple. Um, this one takes place on the beach in Venice. Um, and is on the island known as Lido, which is the beach island. Lido. The old woman in the chaise stares at the sky, imagines clouds, definition where instead there is only emptiness, blue and unforgiving. Her gold necklace leaves dents on her loose leather chest. She listens to the raucous children playing ball, screaming in German or French or Italian. They are all trilingual in the adjacent capana. She imagines herself with a pail, shoveling sand, packing it flat, smoothing with the shovel so that one crease remains. The sand is the skin of the beach, dry and old as God. She is alone, but not alone. Her man is walking along the water's edge, enjoying the topless beauties, basking on the pier, their hard nipples bobbing in conversation with the sun. She remembers the eyes of men on her once plump breasts. It was not entirely unpleasant. 
but very tiring. Even then, the attendant in his white shorts and yellow cummerbund adjusts the awning overhead, brings her a pail to rinse her feet. She nods and begins her end-of-day ablutions, cool water on her painted toes, gritty towel on her back, breeze picking up over the lagoon, and the sand sinking to the pale bottom, imitating the hourglass, telling her it's time. So I'll finish up now with um, my last poem. Uh, It's a new poem, relatively. Um, For those of you interested in formal matters, all of you at least in the second row, (laughs) my class, um, and others, uh, it's a double sistina. A uh, sistina is made of, don't be frightened, it'll go quickly. A sestina is made of six stanzas, um, each ending um, with the same six words. You probably know this, but just in case you didn't. And so the order in which they appear is, is in a predetermined pattern. So a double sestina is that form times two. So, <laughs> um, and there's also a brief um, envoy at the end, or envoi at the end. I've only written one of those. So just be grateful. (laughs) You get a three-line bonus in this twofer. (laughs) Lost and found. Maybe it's the getting lost that brings me back. The seeming to know every street, Campo Canal, hurling down a familiar path only to end abruptly at water having to retrace my steps, turn, then turn again, looking for the beginning, but finding only that it's gone, not there at all, vanished. That bridge I traversed hours ago is not the bridge I cross now in panic to get back to where I started. The crumbs we dropped are gone, eaten by pigeons or trampled by tourists, swept into the canal by the industrious Spazzino. I open the map again, finger follow the maze to get my bearings. Water, water everywhere. I stop at a bar to buy water, but refuse to ask directions. Reach into the fridge for Pellegrino, pay the barman, and set out again. Next time, following signs to the station, back to my beginning. At the next bridge, I see a patch of Grand Canal, and ah, to the left, down Rio San Trovaso, the Squero, where gondolas are made, its yard littered with boat carcasses, sandole and gondole, crafted, repaired, or junked for spare parts. The waterworthy ones will be pushed out onto Judeca Canal, so wide, sun-drenched, and choppy. I see each wave with its ridge defined the way the painters have trained me to see. There's no turning back once that habit's set. Each wave seen distinctly again and again as it rolls off, lost to the sea. The getting lost, giving into it, finding my way again, seduction and submission, an unwholesome pleasure. By now, the panic's gone. Inside the cycle of eternal return, there's peace. Inside the always going back repetition compulsion to return is refuge, a kind of being lost amniotic water, a fluid uncertainty lifting me up and over the academia bridge, two wooden steps at a time, focused always on the return. Ignoring the Grand Canal, its main street bustle below me, threading to the interior, past canal after canal, my life a movie, the Venetian reel playing the familiar scenes again, my mother pushing a baby carriage, granddaughters in hand, bridge over bridge, story over story, our memories mingling, misremembered, ancient, mostly gone in the head, She fills in her thin past, excuse me, her thin present with vanished incident. The spilled water episode, a favorite. My sister's accident, lied about for years. Now, she takes me back to that rare snow day in Venice, begun with enchantment. My sister, suddenly back from her walk, lit with benediction, every snow-covered canal a gift of grace. 
then returning to the babies, to the eternal laundry, boiling water for diapers, an embarrassing necessity, spilling it onto her legs. Later and again, we said it was for pasta, covering our penurious ways, but the truth, almost gone, asserts itself. Proust, who knew about lies, remembered or imagined the bridge I now see from my window and everything before and after it. His relentless bridge to Albertine, to regrets over the unpurchased Fortuny dress, to Cambrai and back, to Venice, the perfect embodiment of his serpentine mind. There, then gone down another path, winding around and around, pausing to contemplate a canal, then back to the Guermont, losing the point, then finding it again, the pleasure endlessly, lovingly deferred, not diluted by water, but intensified, reflected and multiplied, his medium, his prose, his water, the prose he swam and drowned in, each thought a bridge to another, each desire engendering a new hunger to look back to an old obsession, to follow the course again through the Byzantine chambers of his imagination, each canal opening into a new memory to explore, record before it's gone. Time, the prey, the search, a hunt. Somewhere, he recalls, riding in a gondola, gliding along the Grand Canal, flanked by buildings doubled in water, the chain of marble cliffs he remembered of, in Ruskin. Picturesque as a canaletto, and above, the elegant women waving from the bridge, dressed to the nines for the daily passeggiata display. Again, he calls up Petit Mama and the drifting just so with her back when she was young and he younger, her slender back upright, seated on the velvet chair in front of him, gliding in a gondola down the Grand Canal. I remember the ritual with my own mamita. Again, she appears, inserting herself everywhere, lost and then found. Like water coursing through the city, she circulates endlessly. Our common past, the bridge we cross together when I call. Remember when Laura almost ran into the canal? Once she was water and bridge to me, the connecting force and the canal flowing watery beneath. When she is lost, it will be time to begin again, back at the beginning. For a long time, I used to go to bed early. Marcel's sleepy bridge to the past, now her present. Bedridden at 93, her mind nearly gone, she nobly fakes remembering, distracts me shrewdly by asking for water, please, covering memory loss with thirst. Months later from Venice, I call on my birthday, as always. Again, I rehearse the old times, our view of the canal, then and now, the lagoon green water, the daily walk to Rialto Bridge, her memories mixed with mine. We talk it back, the past, gone, then again retrieved, receding, lost. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Gateskill is not a spirit of the age writer, and her work does not in any clear or predictable way reflect the zeitgeist. This does not prevent some of her fans from claiming for her one or another representative status. Thus, she is more than occasionally said to speak for her generation to provide for her readers a shudder of recognition at the era's obsession with power and strength in all manifestations, or the era's fascination with the link between sex and death. When Mary evokes in her fiction, quote, nightclubs like cheap boxed hell 
full of smoke and giant faces with endlessly talking lips and eyes and snouts swelling and bulbous with beauty, unquote. Sure enough, some readers will believe she is capturing a peculiarly 80s or 90s glamour or bloat, as if there were no smoke-filled clubs any longer, or as if you wouldn't have seen giant faces with endlessly talking lips in the New York City downtowns of the 1950s or 40s. Not at all surprising that Mary herself, confronted with zeitgeist talk, should say, quote, I don't actually think that much, that much about historical qualities of particular eras, unquote. To be sure, when we read about Veronica in Mary's novel of that title and see that she is infected with AIDS, it is clear to us that this character belongs to the years after the early 1980s. But this is not to say that Mary's novel is devoted largely or exclusively to an examination of that period or that its several preoccupations are defined by the era in which the novel is set. By now, Mary Gateskill has been a part of our American consciousness for more than 20 years, and we can say with no misgiving that the menace in her work is insidious and at large. She has made us alert to varieties of distress and hurt we had hoped, perhaps, not to acknowledge. At times, in reading Mary's work, we feel that we are focused on the human gift or appetite for defeat. There is no whiff of self-congratulation in Mary's profiles of suffering. She has none of the nihilist pleasure in showing us to ourselves at our worst or weakest and pretending or implying that our worst is unalterably what we are. Her fiction never reads like a manifesto of awfulness, as if she wanted to cure us of our incurable optimism. Though the fiction is never complacently or blithely committed to tenderness or goodness, it is never defiantly set against any prospect of compassion or redemption. The best of Mary's readers have long understood that her work has a subversive habit of mixing up what have until now seemed to be contradictory qualities. Acid shot through with grace, as one very good reader put it. Currents of empathy, a prose surface that is itself very beautiful. Abrasive and vulnerable, often within a single phrase or sentence, tautness yielding now and then to unguarded lyricism. At one moment, in Veronica, you read, quote, in these pictures, I was what I had once longed for, a closed door you couldn't open, unquote. Blunt and severe, those words, and yes, austerely beautiful, like much else in Mary's work. But even what is harsh or brutal has often an extraordinary worked texture so that you take an improbable, visceral pleasure in the lines. Quote, my livid past still lingered about me, you read, but faintly, like the roar inside a seashell, and my longing for it was a dull, a rhythmic spasm or murmur in the meat of my functioning heart. Unquote. Thrilling, those lines these commingled accents and threads of language, delicate and harsh, bespeaking a vision totally unyielding and a style open to surprise but never accidental. Mary Gateskill. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very relieved to know that my writing is not a manifesto of the awful. <laughs> Good to know. 
Um, I'm going to read a story called The Other Place. My son Douglas loves to play with toy guns. He loves video games where people get killed. He loves violence on TV, especially if it's funny. He's 13, shorter than average with a fine build, hazel eyes and light brown hair. Like me, he has a speech impediment, a condition called essential tremor that causes involuntary hand movements which make him look more fragile than he is. He hates reading, but he loves to draw. He especially loves to draw pictures of men holding guns, or men hanging from nooses, or men cutting up other men with chainsaws. In these pictures, there are no faces, just chainsaws and people being cut in two with blood spraying out. My wife says it's fine as long as we balance it out with other things dinners as a family, discussions of current events, sports, art, nature. But I don't know. When I was a kid, I liked walking through neighborhoods alone, looking at houses, seeing what people did to make them homes. The gardens, the statuary, the potted plants, wind chimes. Late at night, if I couldn't sleep, I would sometimes slip out my bedroom window and just spend an hour or so walking around by myself. I loved it, especially in late spring, when it was starting to be warm and there were night sounds, crickets, the whirring of bats, the occasional car, some lonely person's TV. I loved the darkness of trees, the way they moved against the sky if there was wind, big and heavy movements but delicate, too, in all the subtle reactive leaves. In that soft, blurry weather, people slept with their windows open. It was a small town, and, and they weren't afraid. Some houses, I'm, I'm thinking of two houses in particular, where the Legs and the Myers lived, respectively, I'd actually hang around in their yards late at night. Once when I was sitting on the leg's front porch thinking about stealing a piece of their garden statuary, their cat came and sat with me. I petted him, and when I got up and went for the statuary, he followed me with his tail up. Their statues were elves, but not cute, corny elves, sinister, wicked-looking elves, and I had thought one would look good in my room. But they were too heavy, so I just moved him around in the yard. I did things like that, dumb pranks that could only irritate anyone who noticed them. Rearranging statuary, leaving weird stuff in mailboxes, looking into windows to see where the family had dinner or left their personal things lying around. Or in the case of the legs, where their daughter Jenna slept so close to the window that I could watch her chest rise and fall, like I watched the grass on their lawn stirring in the wind. The worst thing I did was probably put a giant marble in the Myers's gas tank, which could have really caused a problem if it had rolled over the gas hole while one of the Myers's was driving on the highway, but I guess it never did. Mostly, though, I wasn't interested in things that would cause that kind of problem. Mostly, I wanted to sit and watch, to touch their things, to drink their lives. I imagine that some version of these same impulses make me the most successful real estate agent in the Hudson Valley, the ability to know what physical objects and surroundings will most please a person's sense of identity and make them feel at home. I wish Doug had this sensitivity to the physical world and the ability to drink from it. I've tried different things with him. I used to throw the ball with him out in the yard, but he got tired of that fast. He hates hiking only likes biking if he has to get someplace. The thing that's working now a little bit is fishing, fly fishing hip deep in the Hudson River. I believe that I had a normal childhood, but you have to go pretty far afield to find something people might call abnormal now. 
My parents were divorced and then my mom had boyfriends, but this was true about half the kids I knew. She and my dad fought in the house when they were together and then on the phone when they were separated. I mean loud, screaming fights sometimes. I, I didn't like it, but I understood it. People fight. I was never afraid he was going to hurt her or me. I had nightmares occasionally in which he turned into a murderer and attacked me, chasing me, getting closer, me falling down, not able to make my legs move right. But I've read this is one of those primitive fears everybody secretly has, something that doesn't have to do with what really happens. There is a not normal thing you could point to, which is that earlier in her life, before I came along, my mother was a sometime prostitute. But I don't think that counts, because I didn't know about it as a child. I didn't learn about it until six years ago at the age of 38 when my mother was sick with the strain of flu that had killed a lot of people, most of them people her age. She was in the hospital and she was feverish and she thought she was dying. She held my hand as she told me, her eyes weak and sad, her lips still sexy and full. She said she wanted me to know because she thought it might help me to understand some of the terrible things I'd heard my father say to her, things I I mostly hadn't even listened to. It, It wasn't anything really bad, she said. I just needed money sometimes, between jobs. It's not like I was a, a drug addict or, it was just hard to make it in Manhattan. I only worked the good places. I never had a pimp or went out on the street. I never did anything perverted. I, I didn't have to. I was beautiful and they'd just pay to be with me. Later, when she did not die, she was embarrassed. (laughs) She said, way to go, Marcy. On your deathbed, tell your son you're a whore. (laughs) And then, don't die. (laughs) It's okay, I said. And it was. It frankly was not really even much of a surprise. It was the vanity that disgusted me, the preening maudlin drama. I couldn't respect it even then on her deathbed. But I don't think that that confession or what it might have implied has to do with what I think of as it. There was, after all, no evidence of her past, nothing to trigger it. Just suddenly, when I was about 14, I started getting excited about girls being hurt, or killed, actually. A murder movie would be on TV, a girl in shorts would be running and screaming with some guy chasing her, and to me it was like porn. Even a scene where a sexy girl was getting her legs torn off by a shark, screaming, trying to get away, was like pushing a button. My mom would be in the kitchen making dinner, talking on the phone, stirring something, walking around with the phone tucked between her shoulder and chin. Outside cars would go by, a dog might run across the lawn. My homework would be slowly getting done in my lap and this sexy girl would be screaming, God help me, and having her legs torn off. And I would go invisibly into an invisible place that I called the other place, where I sometimes passively watched a killer and other times became one. It is true that I started drinking and drugging right about then. All my friends did. My mom tried to lay down the law, but I found ways around her. We'd go into the woods, me and especially Chet Watazic and Jim Bonham, and we'd drink and smoke weed from Chet's brother, a local dealer named Dan. We would sometimes get Chet's dad to give us a gun. In my memory, he had an AK-47. I don't know how that's possible. And we'd go out to a local junkyard and take turns shooting up toilets, long tubes of fluorescent lights, whatever there was. And then we'd go to Chet's house up in his room and we'd play loud music and tell dumb jokes and watch music videos in which disgusting things happened. Snakes crawling over a little boy's sleeping face and he wakes up being chased by this huge truck driven by a psycho A girl gets turned into a pig and then a cake and then the lead singer bites off her head. (laughs) 
You might think these videos and the guns were part of it, that they encouraged my violent thoughts. But Chet and Jim watched and did the same things, and they were not like me. They said mean things about girls. They were disrespectful sometimes. But they did not want to hurt them. Not really. They wanted to touch them and be touched by them. They wanted it more than anything. You could hear it in their voices and see it in their eyes no matter what they said. So I would sit together with them and yet be completely apart from them, talking and laughing about normal things in a dark mash of music and snakes and kids running from psychos and girls being eaten. And I would be someplace my friends couldn't see and yet was right there in the room with us. It was the same at home. My mom made dinner, talked on the phone, fought with my dad, brought guys home. Our cat licked itself and ate from its dish. People cared about each other. Jenna Legg slept peacefully. But in the other place, sexy girls, sometimes ugly girls, or older women, ran and screamed for help while an unstoppable, all-powerful killer came closer. The first time I took Doug out to fish, it was awful. Walking to the lake in our heavy boots and clothes, I could feel his irritation at the bugs and the brightness, the squalor of nature in his fastidious eyes. I told him that fly fishing was like driving a sports car as opposed to the Subaru of rod and reel. I went on about how anything beautiful had to be conquered. He just pulled down his mouth. He got interested, though, in tying on the fly. The simple elegance of the knot arrested him. He laid it down the first time, too, placing the back cast perfectly in a space between trees. He gazed at the brown, light-wrinkled water with satisfaction. But when I put my hand on his shoulder, I could feel him inwardly pull away. As I got older, my night walks became rare, with a different, sadder feeling. I would do it not when I was drunk or high, but in a quiet mood, wanting to be somewhere that wasn't the normal social world or the other place. A world where I could sit and feel the power of nature come up through my feet and be near other people without them being near me. Where I could believe in and for a moment have the goodness of their lives. Jenna Legg still slept on the ground floor and sometimes I would still look in and watch her breathe and if I was lucky, see a developing breast swell out of her nightgown. I never thought of killing her. I didn't think about killing anyone I actually knew, not girls I didn't like at school, not the few I had sex with. It was always fantasy or TV girls I thought of. The first time I had sex, I was so caught up in the feeling I didn't even think about killing. I didn't think about anything but I didn't get sex much. I was small, awkward, too quiet. I had that tremor. My face must have been strange as I sat in class, feeling hidden in my other place, but outwardly visible to whoever looked. Not that many did. Then one day I was with Chet's brother Dan on a drug drop. I happened to be in the car with him, getting a lift because his errand, the drop at the local college, was on the way to wherever it was I was going. It was a guy buying, but when we arrived, a girl opened the door. She was pretty, and she knew it. But whatever confidence that knowledge gave her was superficial. We sat there and smoked the product with her and her boyfriend. The girl sat very erect and talked too much, like she was smart. But there was a question at the end of everything she said. When we left, Dan said, that's the kind of lady I'd like to slap in the face. I said, why? But I knew. I don't remember what he said because it didn't matter. I already knew. And and later, instead of making up a girl, I thought about her. I forgot to mention, 
One night when I was outside Jenna's window, she opened her eyes and looked right at me. I was stunned, so much so that I couldn't move. There was nothing between us but a screen with a hole in it. She just looked at me and blinked. I said, hi. I held my breath. I hadn't talked to her since the third grade. But she just sighed, turned over and lay still. I stood there trembling for a long moment. And then slowly, carefully, I walked through the yard and onto the sidewalk, back to my house. I cut school the next day and the next because I was scared that Jenna would have told everybody and that I would be mocked. But eventually I realized that nobody was saying anything, and I went back. I looked at Jenna cautiously and then gratefully, but she didn't look back at me. At first this moved me, made me consider her powerful. I tried insistently to meet her eyes to let her know what I felt. And then her eyes finally met, and I realized she didn't understand why I was looking at her. Although her eyes had been open that night, she had been asleep. She'd looked right at me, but she had not seen me at all. So, one night, really early morning, I got out of bed into my mom's car and drove to the campus to look for her, the college girl. The campus was in a heavily wooded area bordering a nature preserve. The dorms were widely scattered, though some, resembling mid-sized family homes, were clustered together. The girl lived in one of those, but though I remembered the general location, I couldn't be sure which one. I couldn't see in any of the windows because even the open ones were shaded. While I was standing on a paved path between dorms, I saw two guys coming towards me, and quickly I walked off the path into a section of trees and underbrush, coming to a wide field behind a giant fortress dorm. I walked between field and wood, headed towards the nature preserve. As I walked, I could feel things coming up from the ground, teeth and claws, eyes, crawling legs, and brainless eating mouths. A song played in my head, an enormously popular romantic song about love and death that supposedly made a bunch of teenagers kill themselves. Kids still listen to this same song. I once heard it coming from the computer in the family room. When I came in and looked over Doug's hunched shoulder, I realized the song was being used as a soundtrack for a video about a little boy in a clown mask murdering people. It was spellbinding. The eerie harmony of the song juxtaposed with terrified screaming. I told Doug to turn it off now. He looked pissed, but he did it and went slumping out the door. I went back and looked at it later. I went back to the campus a lot. I went to avoid my mother as much as anything. Her new boyfriend was an asshole, and she whined when he was around. When he wasn't around, she whined about him on the phone. Sometimes she would call two people in a row to whine about exactly the same things he'd said or done. Even when I played loud music so I couldn't hear her, I could feel her. When that happened, I would put on music so she'd think I was in my room and I would go to the campus. I would follow female loners as closely as I could, and I would feel the other place running against the membrane of the world, but not quite touching. What is it that makes sense about putting romantic music together with a little boy in a mask murdering people? Because it did make sense. I just don't know how. It seems dimly to do with justice, with some wrong being avenged, but what? The hurts of childhood? The stupidity of life? The kid doesn't seem like he's having fun. Random murder just seems like a job he has to do. But why? (sighs) 
Soon enough, I realized the college campus was the wrong place to think about making it real. It wasn't an environment I could control. There were too many variables. I needed to get the girl someplace private. I needed to have certain things there. I needed a gun. I could find a place. There were deserted places. I could get a gun from Chats. I knew where his brother kept his. But the girl. Then when I was in the car with my mom, we saw a guy hitchhiking. He was middle-aged and fucked up looking, and my mom, we were stopped at a light, remarked that nobody in their right mind would pick him up. Two seconds later, somebody pulled over for him. My mom laughed. Most of the people that picked me up hitchhiking were men, but there were women too. No one was scared of me. I was almost 18 by then, but I was still small, quiet looking. Women picked me up because they were concerned about me. Mostly I didn't really plan to do it. Mostly I just wanted to feel the gun in my pocket and look at the woman and know that I could. There was this one, a 30-ish blonde with breasts I could see through her open coat. But then she said she was pregnant and I started thinking, what about if I was killing the baby? Doug had a lot of nightmares when he was a baby, by which I mean between the ages of two and four. When he cried out in his sleep, it was usually Marla who went to him. But one night she was sick, and I told her to stay in bed when I went to comfort the boy. He was still crying for her when I sat on the bed, and I felt his anxiety at seeing me instead of his mother, felt the moment of hesitation in his body before he came into my arms, vibrating rather than trembling, sweating, fragrant with emotion. He had dreamed he was home alone and it was dark and he was calling for his mother, but she wasn't there. Daddy, he said, there was a sick lady with red eyes and mommy wouldn't come. Where is mommy? That may have been the first time I truly remembered her, the woman in the car. It was so intense a moment that in a bizarre intersection of feelings I got an erection with my crying child in my arms. The day it happened was a bright day, but windy and cold, and my mom would not shut up. I had just wanted to watch a movie, but even with the TV turned up loud, I guess that's why she talked. She didn't think I could hear. I couldn't blot out the sound of her yakking about how ashamed this asshole made her feel. I whispered, if you're so ashamed, why do you talk about it? She said, it goes back to being fucking molested. It's so fucking corny. I went out in the hall to hear. The worst of it was he wouldn't even look at me, she said. That's why I fall for these passive-aggressive types who turn me on and then make me feel ashamed. Whoever she was talking to must have said something really funny then because she laughed. I left the TV on and walked out. I took the gun, but more for protection against perverts than the other thing. I gave my boy that dream as surely as if I'd handed it to him. But I've given him a lot of other things, too. The first time he caught a fish, he responded to my encouraging words with a bright glance I will never forget. We let that one go. But first he held it in his hand, cold and quick, muscle with eyes and a heart, specked with yellow and red and one tiny orange fin. Then the next one, bigger, leaping to break the water, I said, don't point the rod at the fish. Keep the tip up. Keep it up. And he listened to me, and he brought it in. There's a picture of it on the corkboard of his room. The fish in the net, the lure bristling in its crude mouth. She was older than I'd wanted, maybe 40, but still good-looking enough. She had a voice that was strong 
and lifeless at the same time. She had black hair and she wore tight black pants. She didn't have a wedding ring, which meant nobody would miss her. She picked me up on the lightly traveled on a lightly traveled road. She had a talk show on the radio and she asked if I wanted to hear music instead. I said, "No, I I like talk shows." Yeah? Why? Because I'm interested in current events. I'm not, she said. I just listen to this shit because the voices make me relax. I don't really care what they're talking about. They were talking about a war somewhere. Bombs were going off in markets where people bought vegetables. Somebody's legs had been blown off. We turned onto a road with a few cars, but none close to us. You don't care? No, why should I? Oh, about this? There was something about a little boy being rushed to an overcrowded hospital. Yeah, that's bad. But it's not like we can do anything about it. On the radio, foreign people cried. I said, "Do you have kids?" "No." But I'd feel the same if I did. I took the gun out of my pocket. Take me to Old Post Road. I'm going to the abandoned house there. I'm not going by there, but I can get you pretty close. I think it's cute you're interested in current events. I didn't give a shit at your age. Take me there or I'll kill you. She cocked her head and wrinkled her brow like she was trying to be sure she heard right. She looked down at the gun and cut her eyes up at me. She looked back at the road. The car picked up speed. You better take the next right. My voice then did not come from me, but from the other place. She hit the right turn signal. The voices on the radio roared. She pulled over to the side. "What are you doing?" She put the car in park. "Turn right or I'll fucking kill you." She unbuckled her seat belt and turned to face me. "Okay." She leaned back, gripping the steering wheel with one hand like to steady herself. With her free hand, she tapped herself between the eyes. Bright blue, hot, rimmed with red. Put it here. Go for it. A car went by. The passenger glanced at us. The radio kept talking. I don't want to do it here. There's witnesses. You need to take me to the place. <laughs> what what witnesses? That car's not stopping. Nobody's going to stop unless the emergency lights are on. Frankly, they probably won't even stop then. But if I shoot you in the head, the blood'll come out the window and somebody could see. But my voice just sounded like me. The radio kept talking. Oh, okay, then then do it here. She opened her jacket to show me her chest. Nobody'll hear and when you're done you can get me in the passenger seat and drive the car wherever. Get in the passenger seat and I'll and I'll do it. <laughs> no. I'm not going to your place with you. You do it here now. I realized then that her hair was a wig and a cheap one. For some reason that made her seem crazy. I held my gun hand against my body to hide the tremor. Come on. Come on. Like a star, a red dot appeared in the white of her left eye. The normal place and the other place were turning into the same place, quick but slow, like a car accident is quick. but slow the blood in her eyes spread raggedly she said honey you going to do it or not words appeared in my head a sign flashing 
I don't want to. She leaned forward and turned on the emergency flashers. Get out of my car. Just get out. As soon as I got out, she hit the gas and burned rubber. I walked into the field next to the road without an idea of where I might go. It occurred to me after she was gone that she could call the police, but I felt in my gut that she would not. In the other place, there are no police, and she was from the other place. Still, as I walked, I took the bullets out of the gun and scattered them as I went, kicking snow over them and stamping it down. I walked a long time. I came across a drainage pipe and threw the empty gun into it. I thought, I should have gut shot her. That's what I should have done, and then got her to the abandoned house. But I knew why I hadn't. She was already dead. The fly bobbing on the brown gentle water. The long grass is so green they reflect fine bright green in the brown water. The primitive fish mouth straining for life. It's vanishing. The blood bursting in her eye. That poor woman. My poor mother. The hurts of childhood that must be avenged. So small, so huge. Before I grew up and stopped thinking about her, I thought about that woman a lot. About what would have happened if I got her there to the abandoned place. I don't remember any more the details of these thoughts, only that they were distorted and blurred. Her broken face, broken voice, broken body left on the floor to die, watching me go with dimming, despairing eyes. These pictures are faded now and far away, but I still feel something about them. <clears throat> the second time I put my hand on Doug's shoulder, he didn't move away inside because he was too busy tuning into the line and the fly. Inside him somewhere, there is the other place. It's quiet now, but I know it's there. I also know that he won't be alone with it. He won't know that I'm there with him, because we will never speak of it. But I will be there. I will not leave him alone with that. <clears throat> 